Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, remove this. And the, uh, uh, I want to congratulate you. You are very brave. We, we have such a beautiful weather since two months, and then suddenly we have this for my lecture tonight. You know. The, anyway, and uh, okay. So to, uh, tonight I will proceed in three steps. Uh, I want to. Uh, deal with one concept that we have not touched yet and who still remains, I think, quite important when we speak of the group of seven and uh, especially even like last time what we did about Lauren Harris, uh, the concept of sublime. And I think it's not only important to understand better the, the group of, of seven, but also for uh, a certain period, let's see, of landscape painting in general. Then I will try to apply this uh, to the specific case of uh, G. Uh, J. E. H. MacDonald, uh, one of the group of seven of which uh, you remember I have not mentioned, I think, or didn't speak at least uh, maybe just a word. Uh, and so I think it would be the time uh, uh, to deal with this. And then I think my main subject will be about two painters who have reacted against this idea of the sublime in landscape painting, uh, Goodrich Roberts and David Mill. Uh, you will see, I will try to define them in contradistinction from the group of seven. I think they, they were uh, really trying completely different approach. And, uh, but it's important to, to see uh, the originality of their approach, to put it in context, and even you will have to, to bear with me a little bit long to, to start with, with this idea of the, of the sublime that I want to establish clearly, and then after, I think we could understand better how these painters, and even the one we will see next time, like Stanley Cosgrove, also took distance from that, wanted to be uh, different, uh, and for, for reasons that could be explained. So the uh, first, okay, first section, if you want, this idea of sublime, let's say I will try to define it uh, in an in aesthetic term, and then we will see uh, some example uh, with, uh, with the slides uh, taken from romantic uh, uh, period uh, in uh, Germany, and especially with the, with the work of uh, Caspar David Friedrich, uh, w which is a very uh, good example of, uh, of this idea. We have really uh, put it in picture, I would say, and, and is very illustrative for that. But first, uh, the, the idea itself. I guess the best source um, to deal with this is Edmund Burke, uh, uh, which is an, a kind of unlikely man to deal with the idea like beauty and sublime because he was a politician. And you don't expect from politicians, especially nowadays, <laughs> such lofty ideas. But he did, he did uh, a book which is called A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful, who was published in 1756 when he was a relatively young man. Let's say he was 27 years, so I guess politics didn't take over much. But after, he will be mixed in the uh, Whig party, in particular, who, as you know, uh, dismissed James II and was instrumental to uh, start the, the new uh, dynasty of the Hanover that uh, follows the Stuarts. Uh, and he was also mixed uh, with the uh, being born in Dublin himself uh, with uh, the attitude toward the, uh, the Irish, the Catholic Irish, and also he took side uh, in the American Revolution. Anyway, he was really involved in the politics of his time, and but I would say before dealing with all this, he had this little uh, book, uh, which is m uh, very important because it has been quoted so often. Like that. Mind you, it's not well known in the francophone milieu. The, the, the French people don't know much about Edmund Burke, and I must uh, tell you myself that I, I, I've read this uh, relatively recently, and uh, it's typical of our, the, the, our two culture. Since I give this lecture in English, it's a, for me it's a wonderful experience because I'm, I have the impression to be uh, discovering a new culture and quite clear, close to home since it's a Canadian culture. But anyway, because as you know, I worked so much on Quebec art before, so now I try to broaden my, my scope a little bit. And the, uh, 
In this, okay, so let's see how Burke uh, reason about the, the sublime. He starts by saying, beauty is not of the order of knowledge. Uh, uh, beauty is something that uh, you don't need to know too much about to react to a beautiful thing. Uh, this is his first point. And uh, then, a little bit like uh, Immanuel Kant will say that also, that you have three types of judgment. You have a judgment who can establish what it is, and this is the logical one. You have a judgment who can establish what should be, this is the moral one, and you have a judgment of taste that discover what is beautiful or not. Uh, a little bit this idea that taste or beauty is in an order more of sensitivity, more of, of uh, a, a gut reaction, if you want, in front of something beautiful, and doesn't need always reasoning and a kind of conceptual construction to, to touch us. Uh, this is their, their first idea. The second idea it was, okay, what is exactly the quality that uh, bring this reaction of, wow, this is beautiful, this is really interesting. And uh, then Burke distinguished, he says there's two. There's beauty and sublime, and we should not uh, confound uh, or t uh, mix uh, both. We should, we should see the difference. He says, first of all, beauty attracts spontaneously a reaction, but the sublime impose on us a certain uh, constraint. You see, it's not a thing that you have spontaneously. It's a thing that uh, uh, takes you over in a certain way. You are not ready to surrender to it, but then it's so important, it's so big, it's so impressive that sort of you, you don't have much other reaction uh, possible than that. And then he had that the sublime habitually goes a little bit with fear, with terror. Uh, because it's something in nature, for instance, who will be so big, so much uh, uh, out of proportion that uh, you, th your first reaction will be fear, will be some anxiety because this thing can hurt me, this thing can be more powerful than I am. But then he says, being at a reasonable distance of the phenomenon, you have a certain delight in it. Uh, you have the two aspects, fear, terror, if you want, and then delight because you are not threatened by it, but basically you, you, can, uh, you, you, you are on a safe place. Let's say you look at Niagara Falls, but uh, you, you are, you see uh, we, there's a fence and there's a lot of people uh, around you, so you will not fall in the water. So the things can be uh, scary to, to look at, but on the other hand, you are yourself safe, you have a safe distance, and then you, you have this mixture of terror, first and then uh, uh, suddenly some delight. Uh, and he says this is typical of the reaction in front of a sublime landscape or sublime whatever phenomenon that we can describe that way, uh, which is then very different from the reaction to beauty because the reaction to beauty is spontaneous, is, uh, is without any after uh, thought, if you want, it's right away, wow, this is beautiful. And, and uh, in a way, you could say even that it enhances our feeling of freedom. Uh, the, in, the, in the sublime, you are, you are uh, imposed almost uh, the, the, your reaction by the, the, the power and the force and the magnitude of the phenomenon in which you are. Uh, yeah, it, it is, in a way, constraining, but then there is a certain delight. And you could have an uh, essay of uh, explanation, I would say, psychoanalytic uh, explanation of this uh, double uh, type of feeling. You see that first terror and then delight. Uh, I'm, I quote here uh, Thomas uh, Wieskill, uh, a psychoanalyst who, who tried to uh, uh, to put it in Freudian term, I know that it's not always uh, easy to, uh, to swallow all this, but anyway, I think it explains well the passage from one feeling to the other. He uh, uh, says that the power of anything is ultimately the ability to hurt, uh, and the fear of injury makes us anxious, of course. Uh, even if we know that certain fears are not realistic, Nevertheless, they operate subjectively as real fears. A fantasy of aggression or resistance toward a superior power is played out in the imagination, and we see at once what we will lose. This is the, the part of the, the feeling in which there is, I was mentioning terror or fear or anxiety, in which 
Of course, you are not really threatened, otherwise you will just run away, you will, you will not stay there. Huh? You are not really threatened, but at least it, it must have this element of terror, this element of fear uh, included there. And on, on one hand, the ability to hurt must be objective and obvious. On the other hand, it must, it must not be actually directed against oneself, or the fantasy dissolve into genuine panic and the objective uh, defense of flight. Uh, of course, if you are really threatened by somebody, if the wall fall on you, well, yeah, it's not a time to say, well, this is a sublime spectacle. I will, <laughs> you just run. <laughs> you, you, uh, if it, uh, that's why th there is a certain aspect in which you are protected against the, what, what can happen. This makes possible a positive resolution of the anxiety in the delight of a third phase, uh, which is psychologically an identification with a superior power. I think this is interesting. It is what happened, in fact, it is that suddenly you identify with, or you, if you want, you internalize this power is outside of you, and you participate to it in a certain way, and that's why you feel good, you feel suddenly the, the delight in, in the phenomenon. Uh, so this, to summarize a little bit what, what the Burke idea about the sublime. Then you will have, uh, let's say, philosopher after who will take it over, and especially Immanuel Kant. Uh, uh, one of the early books of Kant, again, is uh, about this idea of beauty and sublime, and also moral value, and in which he, uh, he goes a little bit further because he tried to specify exactly which type of landscape, of which type of spectacle will create a reaction of terror and delight. Uh, and he brings two examples. He brings the example of the mountain and the example of the storm. Uh, and uh, these examples are not uh, taken at random like this. They are very important. And they are very important in painting also, in landscape painting. Uh, the mountain, uh, you, you saw with the, with the lecture on Iris la last time, uh, that uh, indeed this was a, one of the a very important theme in the uh, production of Iris. And uh, certainly with, with this overtone you see of, of uh, truth coming from mountain, from above, from the Himalaya and all this, and eventually being a spectacular so great and so imposing that uh, you have this mixture of terror and, and delight you see in front of it. And the storm of course also is a, an obvious example. Uh, we will see now the, uh, how this will translate in romantic picture first, in, uh, let's see, uh, like I told you, basically of Caspar David Friedrich, and then I will try to apply this a little bit to the uh, group of seven. Uh, here, in this painting uh, of Friedrich, it was called Charles Cliff on Rungen uh, of 1808-1809, uh, 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 about. Uh, it represents, in fact, a region that Friedrich knew very well, because he was born uh, near this place. Uh, Rungen is an island completely in the north of Germany, almost on the border of Poland, uh, in a region that's called Pomerania and w where he was born, and in which uh, you have a uh, cliff like this one who is in chalk, in a way, and give this kind of strange uh, geological formation that he tried to, to represent it. Here, of course, the mountain is seen from, uh, I would say, uh, above. Uh, the, the artist is there on the right, uh, looking at, the, at uh, the landscape uh, of the Baltic Sea. You see that you see in front of him, and uh, you have uh, Two other personages who seems to be uh, uh, one uh, very prudent, you see he's on four legs to, to, to look in the abyss down. Uh, then I would say that the element of terror will come from the vertigo, uh, the fact you are uh, very high in a mountain and you have this. Uh. Uh, we have a description of this uh, region, let's say, as being especially uh, dear to Friedrich by one of his friends, uh, a man called von Schubert, I guess it's a name easy to, to uh, uh, remind, and he says, uh, I quote, he says, the quiet wilderness of the chalk mountains and oak forests of his native 
island of Rügen was always his favorite place in summer, and even more so in the stormy days of late autumn and in early spring, when the storm was at its peak and foam-crested waves rose up and rolled over, he would stand drenched by the spray of sudden downpour and gaze upon those wild waters as if it were overwhelmed with joy, and then he will mutter in low voice, how great, how mighty, how magnificent. Uh, you have there exactly the two aspects of the sublime I was mentioning. One's the, t the, the, the fear, if you want, because there's big water coming toward him and all that, and also the excitement, how magnificent, how beautiful, how, how extraordinary it is. Uh, really, the, the two things. So the mountain landscape will be uh, not just a team among others. It's a team that romantic painters like, like him and others like people of the group of seven who will follow in that direction will uh, will treat with favor. You see, this is a, a team that will stand out from all the other possibility that, that there is to paint. Uh, uh, other example, let's say I show you uh, the whole painting and in detail. Uh, again, of Friedrich, it's a, a mountain landscape in the recent Gebirge, uh, again, in the region where, where, where he lives. And the, the detail to me, uh, I, I look at this, and I, 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 I thought it, it looks almost like a, a Peter Krauss painting. I don't know if you know his work, but as if he, he, his uh, recent landscape, I've just uh, taken an element like this of, uh, of uh, uh, Friedrich painting. These paintings are not very big. Huh? I don't, always when we show a slide, we always have the same problem. Everything looks alike. And when we see these things for real, we are always shocked. Uh, remember the, the first time you saw the Mona Lisa, and it's a little painting. And, okay, so the, the painting of, are, 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 are small. Very often also, they are not painted on the spot. Uh, Friedrich was the type of artist who will go make little trip in the north and he will live most of his life in Dresden, uh, so much more to the south in Germany, and will not be uh, known as a big traveler, as a man going all over the place, so he will do rather from memory. And you do have a painting uh, representing him in his studio in which the walls are completely bare, there's absolutely nothing, even the windows are closed with shutters, and he's painting see, with a lot of intensity, as if exactly only from memory. Huh? Uh, because, of course, what he wants to represent is not only a landscape or something that we could look at, but also something that could evoke uh, ideas and, and sublime, if you want, uh, more than just what we see. For instance, the fact that there's absolutely no human presence there is typical of, of these landscapes, uh, in which uh, I would say they even exclude humanity. Uh, they are so uh, great and so extraordinary that we all we are, like in the previous picture, a kind of witness turning our back and looking at it, or we don't even exist there, just the landscape is presented. No houses, no fences, nothing to remind the, to the human presence there. Uh, so this is certainly one of the, the main themes. I said the other theme that the Count uh, was mentioning was a storm. You don't find in Friedrich, at least to my knowledge, uh, re representation, let's say, of big waves uh, crashing on, on the shore, things like that. Uh, because after all, it's a, it's a kind of cliche. Uh, you have seen this uh, all over the place. All commercial artists are, are trying to do this. And uh, so they, he was more interested to, to do something more original and different. And what, what he did in this picture in particular, uh, who represent, in fact, a monk uh, by the seashore. See, you have one personage, small, in, on the uh, well, left center, if you want, in front of the sea, and again the Baltic Sea, the, the sea that he knows, and then this kind of uh, ominous sky, huge, uh, empty completely, and the reaction, of course, of the people at the time when they saw in the Berlin Academy for the first time this picture, they, they find it, it was really too much, you know, there's nothing to see there, it's like completely empty. Uh? And I, I uh, signal it to you because we will go back to that a little bit later. This is the painting that Robert Rosenblum have used on the cover of his very important book for this subject in particular. Uh, it's called the, uh, 
the uh, modern, well, the romantic modern tradition, you see, how modern art and the romantic northern tradition, how this intervene. And in subtitle, uh, Friedrich to Rothko. Uh, and of course, you could say, if you remove the uh, figurative uh, aspect of this painting, you could have almost a Rothko painting there. Uh, you, you have a kind of huge expand of air, of uh, void, if you want, and two colors. You see the, the black of, of the sea and the, the gray of the foreground. Unfortunately, my slide here is a little bit pinkish. It's, uh, it's there since a long time. But, Okay, so instead of, of uh, treating of the storm, he treat of this landscape who is in a way announce the storm, uh, uh, that it will come, that uh, we don't know really what will, what will happen, and indeed I think he, he get the, to, the, to the same point. There's certain uh, picture of Friedrich who are uh, much more dramatic, uh, like this one. Uh, there was a, uh, problem with with the title of this picture is called now Sea of Ice, I think which is a good description of uh, what it is. But very often you will see in brackets near the title the failed North Pole expedition, the wreck hope of Nug. Uh, the, 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 the wreck hope, hope being the name of a ship, of a specific ship. Apparently this is not a good title, mind you it's a good description of what we see <laughs> because uh, if you pay attention you will see that not only we see uh, these pieces, the uh, jagged pieces of ice, but we see also some remnant of ships. Uh, for instance, uh, here in this uh, region, and you have also some sticks appearing here and there. After, if you look at the picture, after a, a while, you, you will see that there is uh, not only uh, uh, say a kind of uh, high landscape, but also uh, an uh, it's based, in fact, on reading, of course, because uh, Friedrich ne was never there, well, could not see the, these things, uh, and indeed they are really imaginary. Uh, he read about the expedition of William Parry and uh, John Ross, two captains who were involved in the search of the Northwestern Passage uh, at the time. And uh, you know what it was. They wanted to go from England to the Pacific Ocean by the north, uh, following, let's say, the, as, as, as much possible, all the, the north of Canada, uh, uh, ending up in Alaska, and then with the Bering Strait. And uh, what Parry and, uh, and Ross they succeeded to do, they rediscover, let's say, the Baffin Bay, and because uh, since um, Mr. Baffin, who gave the name in the 17th century, it was completely erased from the maps. Nobody ever went there. I, we can understand them. You see, you see that once, and you don't want to go back. And the, so then they, they see the, uh, this Baffin Bay, and they went up to Lancaster Sounds, and, and really each year trying to go further and further, and suddenly being blocked in ice, having to spend the whole winter uh, with, with also with dark sky, uh, because at this level you don't have sun uh, during the, the winter. And Parry described this in his book. Of course he came back from that. He was not wrecked like, like, uh, uh, like uh, suggests here uh, Friedrich. But for his, uh, let's say, f uh, for the team he wanted to, uh, uh, to treat, uh, you understand why he did it. Friedrich transformed the fact uh, an illustration of a travelogue into a tragic image of a no man's land of death. Uh, air is a frozen world, uh, completely, and not only you have this idea of a kind of, I would say, a gothic mausoleum in which, uh, uh, of ice, uh, it, it's even repeated. If you look carefully on the left side, in the back of the painting, you have another huge iceberg of the same type, which seems to be at distance that are, are not uh, even uh, easy to, uh, uh, to grasp. Huh? So the, the, the effect of, of terror there is certainly there, but also this kind of uh, beautiful, uh, well-craft painting, very well organized also, this kind of repetition of these two triangles, the composition of it make it suddenly also almost uh, amiable. Uh, if you want to have uh, another type of uh, of uh, painting on the same subject done by an American artist this time, Edwin uh, Friedrich Edwin Church. Uh, uh, 
which is uh, probably much closer to the film t Titanic <laughs> that most of you have seen where, when you see the iceberg coming toward the ship. But pre precisely, I was thinking of that, I said, okay, cinema, could we have sublime feeling in a cinema? Well, probably some people can, but the security of, of the room in, in, a, in a cinema is such, you know, that you, you want to, unless, I don't know, maybe some more impressionable people, but uh, you are not uh, threatened by the image as much, probably, as you were in front of the, uh, of the real thing. Huh? So Church did not only, you see, he used this idea of a kind of ominous object who's coming toward you, but also the, 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 the night, the fact that it's during the night. And I think this is important also because the night uh, made the form more blurry, more difficult to read on one hand, and uh, so you cannot really identify them easily, and it adds to this idea of threat, if you want, of, of fear. Uh, floating iceberg by uh, Frederick uh, Church. The, sometimes also, the, uh, like a variation of, of this theme, it is to show some unusual atmospheric uh, phenomenon. Like here in this uh, Friedrich painting, mountain landscape with rainbow. Uh, of 1810, who is in the uh, Museum Folk Wang in Hessen. Uh, and what it is, in fact, it is a, what we call a lunar rainbow. Uh, you could have a rainbow during the night, like this, if the moon is very strong, and of course, if you have also the droplet of water that you, you need for any rainbow. But then the, the extraordinary things, it's almost colorless. It's almost achromatic completely. The other type of rainbow you can have like this also, it is with fog. Uh, uh, when uh, the droplets are about 10 times less big than they should be to make a, a colorful rainbow like in, in normal uh, uh, sunlight. Uh. So this is kind of an unusual type of landscape who also in mountain, also in the night, uh, so you had to all these elements who, who will lean toward uh, this uh, idea of, uh, of uh, something ominous, something threatening, but also extraordinary, delightful, like this beautiful curve, of course, of the, the rainbow that you see here. Uh, some, some artists have uh, indeed treated the idea of storm. And uh, since we are uh, in Canadian art, I thought of putting together one American artist on the left, Thomas Cole, and on the right, Osias Le Duc. Uh, uh, L E D U C. Uh, Le Duc. Osias is not a common name uh, in French Canada. I think he's the only one I know that is called like this. But uh, Osias Le Duc was the uh, teacher of Paul Emile Bordeaux. Uh, if you want to situate him, he was. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, living in, partly in 19th century, and he died in 1955. So uh, he's, uh, let's say, uh, an artist of a kind of older generation. Both of them are treating the same subject here. The kind of, you see uh, in the Thomas Cole painting on the left, you see like the storm has passed already and left behind broken trees or, or uh, that you see on, on the foreground. And this is also an interesting idea that the trees could be anthropomorphic, meaning that it could symbolize the uh, certain aspect of human life. Uh, uh, as if the tree will uh, uh, be a metaphor of a human life being first small, growing, and then being broken or having uh, difficulty, let's say, through life, and finally uh, establishing himself. In the Ouzias uh, Le Duc picture, what you see on the foreground is uh, the big tree which have just been splintered by uh, probably uh, uh, lightning uh, created by the huge uh, cloud that you see in the background. Huh? And indeed, the title is Le Cumulus Bleu, uh, the blue cumulus, if you, uh, if you want, uh, meaning that uh, what you want to attract the attention on, it is that this cumulus, this big cloud, have created a vac in the, in the landscape and have completely broke the, this tree. The rest, you see in the background, uh, you see the, the branches and the foliage who are still green, so it just happened in a way, and more or less repeat the shape of the cloud. Uh, you, you could see, in, if you compare the shape of the tree and the shape of the cloud, you have a kind of echo between each other. They can one respond to the other like this. Uh, okay, this is uh, artists, let's say, who have deal more directly with this idea of uh, 
the, the storm. I said the mountain and the storm are two sublime subjects. And if you go back to what we said before about the group of seven, you will see the trees, God knows if there was many representation of trees in tempest, in, in storm, and also the mountain, with, especially with Lauren Iris. You, you remember, so it, these themes in a way were not neutral. They were not just something interesting to show or a kind of documentary aspect. They had also this added meaning in their, uh, in their presentation. Uh, look again, uh, let's see the, the theme of the tree uh, done by Friedrich. Let's see what I was uh, telling you just before about the anthropomorphism of it. In this uh, oak tree, you are oak in snow, it's called, uh, which is described exactly what we see. Uh, not, not only you could see by the branches all the, I would say almost a symbol of all the pain and all the difficulty that the tree have to survive, but nevertheless it's a big tree, it's, a, it's probably there since long, long years, and it shows this mixture, let's see, of fight against odd and also triumph of life, if you want, huh? the, 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 two, the two aspects being together. No? Uh, Friedrich was perfectly able also to uh, create a mystery with the theme of the forest. God knows if it, this theme is important also, say I stressed it last time about Harris, but also in all German painting in, in especially. Huh? This picture is called the chasseur in the forest, but the chasseur here, be careful, is not the hunter. The chasseur is uh, the name of a, soul, of a French soldier. Uh, it's a type of soldier, of a French soldier. So when you see the date of this 1814, you are just at the time when the Napoleonic War was at their peak, if you want. And for Germany, of course, the, the, the chasseur there is uh, the personage that you see there uh, with a helmet on his head. Uh, maybe it's hard to see from where you are, but, but he, he's not like a regular hunter, really. He's a soldier. Uh, will immediately uh, ring the bell. The people will know what it's all about. Uh, and in the foreground, you have a kind of stump there with a bird, with, with a raven. And the raven, of course, is an animal, who, uh, is a bird who is black and uh, doesn't have nice voice and could uh, be interpreted as uh, singing a song of death. And especially the stump itself is like a, a tree who have been cut could also represent death. So on one hand, you have the, an evocation of all the people who died during the war uh, on the German side. And on the other hand, this uh, French soldier getting in the forest, but probably to, be, uh, to never come out from it, you know, because this forest is so huge and so ominous and as if the, the, the snow that he, he will be in will be the snow of death also. And you could see even it's a patriotic type of painting of, uh, of Friedrich uh, where people could identify it and could see. He did also uh, a picture with absolutely no, uh, uh, no personage, but you could see it's like, the, it's like almost like a, a continuation of the first one. Huh? Now the soldier has disappeared in the forest and he's swallowed by it and there's no, no trace left of him uh, in the second picture. Again, the mixture of snow, the huge tree, the mystery of it also. I said, this, I, like I, I told you last time, I this type of approach of the forest are always in a way historical um, in German artists. They, they see, because in a way they go back to the, the very uh, beginning of their history when the uh, Roman legion were uh, beaten, were defeated inside of the forest by attracting them in the forest and then they could not fight the proper way. It was uh, like a, a battle with rows and things like that and they were uh, caught by the uh, uh, by uh, the people of uh, Arme, Armanius or Hermann, if you want, uh, at the time. Uh, it's, uh, there is uh, always the, this idea. The, uh, the other theme that we, uh, that we have just touched a little bit, and I, I will uh, uh, finish with that and then uh, show you some, uh, some other, other aspect. It is the theme of the night. I think this is, again, very important because the night has this property of destroying form. And this is another idea about the sublime that is expressed quite clearly in uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, not in the book that I was quoting before, but in his uh, famous critic of the of judgment of taste, in which he says, beauty goes with form, 
But sublime go with lack of form, within form, if you want, with uh, negative uh, uh, form. Huh? And sublime goes with quantity and beauty goes with quality. Huh? Like a kind of equation like this. So not only uh, you, you will need this kind of, uh, of uh, quantity, but you will need also this kind of uh, lack of form, the disappearing of form. And night, of course, is by excellence the time when form begins to dissolve, when it, they are hard to interpret, when you don't know exactly what it is, and in which you don't have any more color, you don't have a, any way to distinguish uh, let's say an object from its background, uh, everything then suddenly uh, disappears. You know that I during the night we don't see color. Uh, if there's no source of light, we have, abs we have in our eyes uh, just the cells to see the uh, difference between light and, and darkness, but we don't see color at all. Uh, and the uh, painter have always been uh, troubled by that, and many painters have uh, presented light at uh, night with color. But here, Friedrich took a specific time of the day when the moon rises, let's say, so you have a source of light a little bit that makes this yellowish sound. And again, the people in front who are looking at the spectacle, who are like, if you want, a kind of a vehicle for us to identify with them and try to look at the same spectacle. The night is certainly uh, one of the theme also, let's say, if I summarize the three, uh, you have the mountain, you have the storm, and you have the night also, who are all these phenomena, let's say, that could uh, bring this type of reaction. Uh, you had to this, uh, and because uh, we will see example of that also, the, you had to this, this idea of all religious building and eventually even runes. Uh, why? Because one of the ideas of the sublime was to secularize religious experience of the past. Uh, the, the problem was the following during the Romantic era in the 19th century. Uh, you see, we have all these religious experience of so many centuries before, and now, of course, we don't believe in the same way like our ancestors, or we are unbelievers and all that, but it's a pity to lose all the experience, the human experience of religion, if, if you want. All, all, the, all the, the things that people of the medieval time, let's say, were having spontaneously because of their faith. And what is the human element in this that could be saved, that could be, uh, that, that could be still experiment, uh, experience, if you want. And the, the idea was that the, any sublime spectacle could give us a little bit of this religious uh, experience that we had in the past. And one way to express this, it was to, uh, for instance, represent runes of Abbey, like uh, in this Friedrich painting on, on the left, or even to invent, like he did on the right side, a cathedral in the middle of the mountain like this, which is a kind of an impossibility because normally a cathedral is to be accessible by a, a crowd, by a lot of people, but there you, you will not have many believers going there. So you, you have to go through the mountain and all that. But, but then he could give the religious meaning to his uh, landscape of mountain, he could, and of, of the trees also, he could really uh, almost make him visible uh, this connection that uh, was only implied before. Huh? So the, the idea of eventually even uh, make allusion to religious uh, age of the past is also coherent with this. And you will see it even in a uh, more modern painter than, than these people, like Van Gogh, for instance. Van Gogh also will try to represent religious uh, uh, runes or, or old churches and all that with, with the same idea. Not because he believed he was, a, he was an atheist, he was not believing in that, uh, especially at the end of his life, but he was attracted by that. There's something to be saved there. There's something that was important in the human culture that we should try to save. And and we have a way to secularize this old religious idea through the sublime. Uh, you see uh, uh, where it comes from. Uh, the, the other idea, okay, this idea of in form and quantity that Kant brings uh, is, is uh, I think, interesting because you, you will see it also in, in, in painting, of Canadian painting, is the idea of, for instance, of course, the in form by excellence, the lack of form is in water. Uh, and that's why they will be attracted eventually by these. Uh, oh, I have this, and I think I. 
what happened? Okay, yeah, I have two, two pictures by Edwin Church, again, about the Niagara Fall of, of, all, of all places, of course, it, it, it will be perfectly uh, suited to this type of theme, in which water will be seen precisely as something that have no form by itself, but could be transformed by uh, the place where it uh, grows or by any recept uh, receptacle in which it, it could be uh, content. Huh? And, uh, okay, so this, this, I would say, is a good way to, to treat this idea of, of, the, of the lack of form uh, as a way to reach the sublime with the quantity. Uh, when we think now, and I finish with, with this presentation, let's say, of the, of the romantic, when we think now of, the, of uh, let's say, the, the picture of McDonald as an example of uh, uh, modernization, if you want, of these ideas that I expose, you will see. You could ask, for instance, did really they, they paint something w w w with with this lack of form? And indeed, when you have this hypothesis in L, you could find example. For instance, the uh, this famous painting was called the Tangle Garden, done by McDonald. Uh, it is. It have always been, in a way, difficult to read. Uh, this, uh, mind you, maybe this was exactly his intention, since he called it the tangled uh, garden. I would say the composition is tangled here also. So you have difficulty to detach form from their background, and even to situate, let's say, the house who is in the back of the garden. Uh, uh, in, re in relation to the plants or to the, the group of flowers that we see in the foreground. Huh? So as if the, the uh, space there was overfilled, what was uh, without any hair, if you want, any possibility of, uh, of really breathing in that. Uh, you have this accumulation of, of details of color and also this kind of uh, uh, equalization, let's say, in space of all the elements who are there. They are as if they were presented in a more, almost like on a flat space and not suggesting depth or, or a kind of three-dimensional uh, aspect. Huh? And, and this is a way to, to reach this idea also of the non-form, of the lack of form, in order to suggest the, the abundance of life and maybe not anything threatening there, uh, but uh, certainly this, if you, if you imagine, let's say, almost a jungle from there, to if it develop and all that, you could have this feeling of a, uh, a place where there's no limit, where there's no boundaries, let's say, to, to really uh, define uh, the object that they are in front. The theme of uh, water also comes in the picture of McDonald. Uh, for the same reason that, he, that it came in, in, in uh, let's say, church that I saw just before. The, the group of seven, uh, I think, uh, wisely avoided uh, the Niagara Fall theme because, of course, it has been represented so much. You know, this is the first uh, aspect of the Canadian landscape that was ever depicted in picture uh, by a, 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 a a kind of uh, unexpected man. It was a, a father, uh, a Franciscan father, was called Louis Hennepin uh, in 1729, I, if I remember well, published a little book in which there was an engraving that shows Niagara Falls. So right away uh, you have this Niagara And since we have millions of pictures of that. So the group of seven avoided that, I think, because it was already too touristic. Through too tamed in a way. Uh, it's necessary to deal with something that was less tame and in which uh, the experience of uh, a powerful uh, river li like you have here is the Montreal River in the north of Ontario that uh, 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 McDonald have represented and he have represented almost as if you, we were in the river. Uh, you are uh, in the foreground and you are going down toward a more calm uh, part of it. And also the fact there's no sky to look at. The, the mountain on the other side block completely the sky, so you are like immersed in the painting. You have no way uh, to uh, take distance from it. Uh, this is very different from Harris' uh, attitude, in which, in the contrary, you have a kind of empty sky with dead trees in the foreground. You remember what, what I was showing you too. Uh, and this, I think, is closer to this idea of the sublime, in which you are immersed in some uh, natural phenomenon whose, whose fear uh, can give you fear, but on the other hand, in which uh, you participate and you, you get some delight from it. Huh? And uh, so he, he touched the, the, this idea. And I, I may mention about this the, that the Group of Seven was 
maybe like Paul Walton have suggested that, and I think in a way it's interesting. He says they were trying to express uh, what he called an extractionist myth uh, by opposition to a more bucolic myth. What he means is this. It is that the, t the attitude they have to the land, to the north of Ontario, it is a place where there is a lot of resources, a lot of uh, fantastic resources. For instance, these rivers will be a source of electricity. Uh, the, uh, the trees that are there will be logged and it will be exploited and all that. So, and underground, of course, you have mines and things. And so all this north of Ontario, who looks wild and things, is in fact a place where uh, human industry will come and will transform it and will exploit whatever there is to exploit there. Huh? And this is in opposition to a previous generation of painter where, in the contrary, uh, the scenery was seen as, uh, I would say, a more uh, agrarian type of place, more bucolic, if you want. This is where farmers go and, and, and grow things and, and nourish the people and all that. Huh? Like Homer Watson or, or people of a previous generation will treat the landscape that way. With a group of seven, and especially with McDonald, I think he was more maybe sensitive to that. He, he, the, the, the landscape they choose, okay, is sublime, but is also, in a way, uh, expressing this kind of relation to the land like something that you could get power from, that you could get uh, many forms of power. Huh? So the, the sublime there come almost politicized, if you want. Huh? It, it got transformed almost in a kind of uh, politic statement because all these landscapes suddenly could could bring Canada, let's say, some wealth and some transformation. Uh, okay, some people could say, "Wow, this is fantastic!" Like, uh, I'm sure that Monsieur Bourassa, for instance, in the LD, will see the transformation of all the north of Quebec with dams and all this, like a wonderful thing. We are less sure of that today, but anyway, and the uh, with the ecology and the environment uh, problem that that, say, that we feel today. But but nevertheless, this idea that the land could be uh, uh, a place where we extract resources is very much behind the, this type of painting. And you see that it's not contradictory to the, the romantic feeling about the sublimity uh, of the landscape. Uh, the, the most famous picture of uh, MacDonald is this one, the, uh, probably. Uh, the, uh, the, it's called Solemn Land. And even you know, right away with the title, of course, you get uh, this idea of the sublime. It's in 1921, and as you know, it's at the National Gallery in Ottawa. Uh, the, it's interesting to compare the finished painting that I show you on the left with sketches that prepare it. And, and you, will see, uh, you can almost feel the transformation that he did to what he was actually seeing. On the right side, you have it's a small little sketch. It's about this size, let's say. And in which uh, you have more or less the same, uh, exactly the same point of view and all that. And indeed, when you look at the sketch, you have the feeling that the scale is much smaller, uh, that uh, the, the place seems more uh, little than what he did with it, as if everything in the big painting was suddenly, uh, uh, I would say, subtly change in order to give more power and more uh, magnitude to, to the landscape in which uh, he was looking. Look, this is a sketch number one. There's another one where the color is more, uh, let's say, uh, pure and more clear than in the finished painting. And what happened, in a way, in the finished painting, it is the contrast that you have in a sketch is subdued. Uh, as if the, uh, the reading that we, keep, we can make of each plan, one behind the other, is blurred a little bit. In the big painting, it's hard to know exactly where is the foreground, where is the middle ground, and where, where we go. For all this, uh, let's say, all this region here, all this part, is treated more or less with the same type of color. Okay, after you have contrast with the, with the big uh, cliff there, but much more in the, uh, in the previous sketch, uh, as if now he wants to create this kind of lack of form, if you want. And then, of course, the multiplication of trees and of little elements of the, of the clouds and everything had to this, uh, this kind of quantity 
uh, aspect that I was mentioning before, you see, in which to create this powerful image, this solemn land, let's say, from a relatively um, enclosed and small landscape. It's not small, but relatively uh, smaller than what he, he did with it. Uh, the transformation from one sketch to the other uh, was, uh, uh, is interesting to see. Okay, so what will happen after this very long uh, disquisition? What will happen with people who will react against this idea of the sublime? Huh? I think the first sign of it, it is that suddenly you see painters, and this is, I guess, the main line of my argument, the, suddenly you will see painters for which subject matter become a little bit indifferent or even the idea that anything can be a good subject matter to paint with. Uh, I will quote you, uh, no, let me go like this, and here. Okay, I will quote you uh, a passage uh, written by Edward Hopper, uh, an, an American artist, of which you have probably seen uh, many times reproduction uh, of, uh, on the left side, it is his early Sunday morning uh, picture that he made in 1930. It was at the Whitney Museum, I think. And the, uh, on the right side is a picture by Charles Birchfield, uh, which is an American artist, also well, less known. But since Hopper speak about Birchfield, I thought to putting them together like this to, to illustrate uh, what he says. <laughs> and Birchfield uh, have entitled his picture, Houses by the Creek. Uh, so you see a uh, water and then these poor houses in the background. Of course, the picture of Hopper is more stark. It's more, uh, it's, it's really uh, not much to see and all that. And, and listen what Hopper says. And I think this is very typical of artists who suddenly are not uh, interested by the sublime. Uh. The subject matter becomes very secondary. Uh. He says, no mood has been so mean as to seem unworthy of interpretation. The look of an asphalt road as it lies in the broiling sun at noon, cars, locomotives lying in the godforsaken railway's yard, the steaming summer rain that can fill us with such hopeless boredom, the blank concrete walls and steel construction of modern industry, midsummer street with the acid green of close-cut lawns, the dusty forts and gilded movie, all the sweltering, tawdry life of the American small town, and behind all the sad desolation of our suburban landscape. Huh? Nothing for Hopper is, cannot be a subject of painting. Huh? The moment you get this attitude, I would say, what, what happened? So what is left to paint? If it's not beautiful subject like mountain, like the night, like the, the trees, and things like that, if, you, if all this become indifferent, then what becomes the most important aspect is the form. Huh? If the subject matter is no more important, what the artist is about to work with is the, is the formal aspect of this picture. Huh? And in a way, it's what Hopper suggests here. Even in a street like this, who have no interest whatsoever, I, mean, I guess it's the most depressing place to live in, huh? with the uh, kind of barber pose there as the only sculpture that you see. And uh, and he dreamt. Uh, this is the two personages of this place on Sunday more early Sunday morning. Hopper used to like to paint early like this because he was not bothered by anybody. He could, he could paint uh, uh, quietly. And okay, so this place, a kind of nondescript place, becomes a painting because Hopper is interested in form, in color, in, in the way light will play on surface and things like that. He will then try to, uh, uh, in a way, go back to the idea of the beautiful. Yeah? Because if, if sublime goes with subject matter, with something intelligible, something of the spirit, if you want, well, uh, the people who are interested in form will go with more uh, sensual type of approach to, to, to the world and will be less interested in ideas, but they will be interested in form. Huh? And this passage of uh, sublimity, let's say, of the romantic era, to a more modern type of approach is very, very important, very crucial to understand. Because in a way, it was not so easy to do. Uh, it was not easy because the sublime was permitting two things that seems to be now excluded. The first thing, it was the possibility to express ideas and profound ideas with painting. Uh, because in, in the case of, of uh, 
of let's say uh, what what we saw before of Friedrich and all that. Behind each painting, you are more or less a reflection on human life, on the tragedy of life, on the tragedy of uh, human existence, uh, and you have this uh, like like the main theme. Huh? Suddenly, if you you refuse the, the sublime, you put yourself in a situation where this type of lofty ideas or lofty ideals even are no more possible. If, if, if you have to grasp them, you will find a completely different way to do it. Huh? And the other thing also it is that the secularization of religious idea that the sublime uh, was making possible is excluded. You have a much more secularized type of painting when you deal only with sensual uh, reaction toward the modern, uh, to, to, to the, uh, the world, let's say, uh, and, and you are uh, maybe not uh, necessarily atheistic, but you don't have anymore this religious idea, not even in their secularized form. Uh, and this is why that even when painting will pass through ab to abstraction, uh, you will have painters who will maintain the idea of sublime even in abstract art. Uh, you, you, uh, be careful, don't confound the end of sublimity, uh, which linked to romanticism, with the end of uh, figurative painting. Not at all. And the best example of that, I think, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Rosenblum have suggested, is Rothko. Uh, uh, Rothko speaks of his painting exactly in the term that I was using before. He would speak of the tragedy of human existence. That's what he wanted to express. And that's why the comparison, let's say, of his painting uh, with, whoops, no, plus <laughs> uh, tard. Uh, the, the comparison of his painting with the Friedrich uh, painting, uh, the monk near the sea could be uh, interesting. Huh? This is what uh, uh, Robert Rosenblum I've suggested, you see, that you have indeed a link between both. Huh? It starts with Friedrich and it, it ends up with the abstract expressionist, the American abstract expressionist, in which, let's say, Clifford Still and Rothko and Newman are all uh, dealing with, with this idea of the sublime, even on the abstract form, because they don't want to get rid of uh, this idea that painting could express uh, important ideas, important values, and be just a kind of a optical or sensual type of reaction to the world. Uh, I, I, so I, I want to stress that because this is really the dilemma of uh, the other painting. Uh, could we make painting who could be uh, still exciting, still interesting, and getting rid of all these uh, ideas? And, and let's see, in Canada, the man who have uh, advocated this probably this more strongly is uh, to start it was John Lyman. Uh, Lyman hated the group of seven. He had no patience with them. He called them romantics and sentimental and all that. And he was not a great landscape, uh, landscape painting, as you can see yourself by the example on the left. He was much more interested by constructing a painting from, uh, let's say, a model or things like that. This painting uh, is, is not too big. It's big like that. We, I live with, with it for, for many years. It was a collection of my father, and it ended up now in a museum. But the, uh, uh, this type of, uh, of, of construction you see in which the, the model is, is himself almost like a sculpture, and have no, you have no uh, special type of uh, relation with it. You see, it's, uh, uh, you cannot read uh, the expression of his face, e even all this is like almost an abstract painting in a way. Of course, Lyman never uh, accepted uh, to, to uh, um, faire le poste, that is, to, to cross the line toward uh, abstraction. He found it uh, an easy way out in a way. He thought that a figurative painting had to be well constructed, and this, there was a real challenge to it. But, but you see, let's say in Canada, if you, if you uh, uh, see the reaction to the group of seven and to this idea of sublime, I think it's important to see uh, uh, the role that Lyman have done as a, almost, I would say, as a painter, but also as a thinker, as somebody who have expressed this idea quite clearly. Okay, we'll stop a little bit uh, because this was the idea. We will make two, two sections. We'll stop 10 minutes. And uh, then I will deal with uh, David Milne and Roberts as example of these people who have uh, follow a little bit the lead of Lyman. And uh, okay, no, no, don't applaud. <laughs> we have still an hour to do. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, 10 minutes.